So, last week, again, we talked about, again, sin and the concept of sin and what sin was. So this week, we're going to talk about specifically the understanding of authentic awareness versus self-deception. Because you can't really know what you don't know. So that's always, again, the question is, am I lying to myself? And actually, for the most part, that's a good thing. If you have wondered that at times, am I lying to myself? Or am I deceiving myself? Am I really spiritually mature? Um, that, if you are wondering that, that's a good thing. That actually might be an, an indication you are slightly spiritually mature. Or you are very spiritually mature. Um, my mom told me something which I really believe is true and which really helped me a lot when I was a little kid. When I was always fearful of going to hell. I'm getting excited. Great fear of going to hell when I was mom. Okay, because my mom, probably like some of you in the room, was a very strong Catholic, and again, there's lots of things that would send me to hell <laughs> if I did them. Uh, but again, there was one point where again I came to my mom, and I was really scared and terrified of some particular thing I had done. And again, I had this overwhelming sense of going to hell, and again, uh, things like this. And what she told me was this: she's like, people who people don't go to hell who worry about going to hell. <laughs> it's people who don't worry about going to hell who possibly will end up in hell. <laughs> Likewise, for the most part, if we wonder at times and we worry at times, we have an anxiety. That is actually not a bad anxiety because that's a good one because it causes deeper self-reflection. If we wonder, am I deceiving myself? Am I spiritually mature? And then we ask God, hopefully the question, how do I grow? Now, there are, again, some tools. And one of the primary tools, which we're going to talk about tonight, to really evaluate in an authentic way whether or not we are spiritually mature, but also if we're deceiving ourselves, is the... what. St. Ignatius of Loyola calls the examine. And I know I've spoken about this in the past in some of my classes, but this is what we're going to talk about a little bit tonight, what an authentic examine looks like. Because, again, just with the concept of our faith, again, the same thing is true of like math and any other subject. When you learned it as a second grader, again, you, didn't, you understand things a lot about more math now. And the same thing is true with our faith. If our faith stays at the, at the level of what we learned in CCD, or we learned from the nuns, and we learned something like this, is that, again, we're going to have the understanding of our faith at the level of a second grader. But our faith is, again, the size of a mustard seed, and like all seeds, it's meant to grow into the largest of tree, which is also that not only our encounter, our relationship with Christ, which is very, very good and absolutely important that that grows in just our constant prayer, our constant receiving the sacraments, but it's also important that we grow intellectually, in our faith, that our understanding of the faith, again, if Thomas Aquinas, who is one of the greatest thinkers in the church, said at the end of his life, he said, everything that I've contributed to the theology is straw. And he actually, at that point, stopped writing. Because he's like, this is all fluff. Again, for the most part, anyone who picks up Aquinas, again, if you have, unless you have a very systematic mind, you're going to struggle through Aquinas. And he said that all of his stuff was fluff compared to what God had revealed to him. So our faith is always something which is called to grow, and especially in our intellectual awareness, because again, that was part of the point of last week's class where we talked about sin, because once you understand actually why we have an understanding of mortal sin and what those criteria are, you realize, again, a lot of the, sometimes the anxiety that we feel from always going to hell can hopefully be lifted off. You don't have to oftentimes worry about, again, that this was a mortal sin. Like I said, in my experience, I've only heard a couple mortal sins. It's very, very rare. I've heard a lot of grave sin. I've heard a lot of people who call their venial sin grave sin. <laughs> I mean, their grave sin, venial sin. But no, grief, grave sin is very serious. But again, at the end, very end of the day, once we understand sin, we understand that we really have nothing to fear as long as we're trying. So tonight, again, in the Art of Spiritual War, again, the question of self-deception. Again, this is an old Navajo proverb. You can't wake a person who is pretending to be asleep. <laughs> So again, self-awareness is actually, again, the key point is that if we are not aware, because a lot of people consider themselves to be aware, self-aware of what's going on in their life, self-aware of things like this. The re end of the day, like listening, most people consider themselves to be good listeners. And what we were taught in the seminary is that we were told the first day, because we actually had a class in listening, we were all told, you're a lousy listener. <laughs> And we all, all of us got insulted by it. <laughs> we're like, no, we're, and I actually, even I myself, I thought, no, I'm a pretty good listener. But as we went through the course, we started discovering that, no, actually, we weren't very good listeners. We preferred to talk a lot as opposed to listen. And the same thing is true of self-awareness. A lot of people assume that they are self-aware. And if you look out into the world today, a lot of people assume, but there's certain things that people won't touch as well, especially if there's, like, elephants in the room. Things that you don't want to talk about, things you want, things you'd prefer to forget and put in the past. And again, not process. 
So self-awareness is at times a painful process because it brings up the garbage in our past. It brings up an awareness of our sinfulness. It brings up an awareness of also the destruction caused by some of our sins and by some of our habits. But again, through the power of Christ, we have nothing to fear in these cases because with self-awareness also comes freedom because we don't have to identify ourselves with the sin itself. We can say, no, I made a mistake. I let it go, and likewise, I've been forgiven, and now I'm going to move forward. Jesus tells the woman caught in adultery, which is a fairly serious sin. It's a grave sin. It's a destructive sin. But he doesn't say you're an evil, adulterous woman. He says your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. But in order to go and sin no more, she's going to be left with the memory of sin. She's going to be left with the memory. She's going to be left with guilt. Guilt, because guilt implies that she learned her lesson, she doesn't want to do it again, and she feels bad about what she did. Guilt is not a bad thing. Guilt is actually a healthy thing in our spiritual life. We should feel guilty for our mistakes. We should feel guilty for especially when we sinned. Because if we didn't feel guilty, we would repeat them over and over and over again, and that's the definition of insanity. Okay? So if we have no guilt, no sorrow for our sin, this is a problem. So having guilt is a good thing. Having shame is not. Shame is when we self-identify ourselves with our sin. Or, likewise, when we impose shame upon other people, it's when we identify a person with their sin. And we say, this is who you are. For instance, a person commits adultery. You are an adulteress. Okay, this has identified the person. You've put a person into a box from which they cannot escape. Or a person who commits an abortion. You say, you are a murderer. Which is also why... the I don't particularly like those signs, even though the signs are effective. But what? It puts people into a box. No, you commit a murder. <laughs> it's a bad thing, but you can be forgiven. And this is actually one of the th- healing things that I tell many women who come to me who have had abortions. I'm just, I tell them, I was like, you made a mistake. It was a very serious mistake. I was like, a child is dead. I was like, but I want you to know something. Your child is in heaven. And being in heaven, your child forgives you. Your child loves you. Your child wants you to be with them. I was like, so there's a tremendous amount of healing there. But if you can't go into the sin, then the person is always running from that area of their life. And therefore, they can't ever experience the freedom of knowing that, you know what? I am not a murderer. I murdered someone, but I don't. This is not the same thing. Does this make sense? Because when we can separate the sin from the sinner then we can also see that this is a child of God. Again, and that's why I won't ever call people by names which are sins, as I've said in homilies before. We cannot call people and identify people with a sin because then we place them into a box from which they cannot escape. Because at the end of the day, we are all children of God. That is our deepest identity. Our identity does not come from sin ever. Our identity always comes from our relationship with God. And the more you can connect a person, and likewise, the more we can connect ourselves in relationship to God, the more that we can experience his healing, loving power. Because he says, no, you made a mistake. You're going to be left with the memory of it. Knowledge once gained is never lost. Even when we try to repress it or forget it or get rid of it, nope, it's always there. But at the end of the day, it's from our wounds and from the wounds of Christ that we can heal others. And so that's a powerful image that from our wounds and from our sins, we can actually go out and help other people from those areas saying, don't follow this because I know what it means because I've done it. And St. Paul is like that. A lot of people consider actually, if you read St. Paul on the surface level, he can be considered arrogant at times, but he has no problem talking about his brokenness and his sin because he's completely self-aware. He doesn't run from those areas of his life. He actually dives directly into them. He embraces them because he doesn't embrace the sin because he's very clear and adamant on calling and naming sin for what it is. But he dives into those areas of his life and he's very cognizant of them because he knows the freedom of being freed from them. That's what he says. He says, I was a murderer. He says, I murdered people. I persecuted. I was a persecutor. But Christ freed me. He says, and now he has sent me to you guys to teach you what this means. So, Self-awareness, again, there's another one. It's discouraging to think of how many people are shocked by honesty and how few by deceit. Again, and if you think about that for a second, when, was the, last, when the last time, and that's actually one, one of the things which I would say in our modern politics, what's going on in politics right now, why a lot of people like some of the politicians who I don't particularly like when I actually listen to what they're saying, but what, at least some of them are honest. 
And that's appealing to some people because what? For the most part, we've not heard honesty in a long time. We've become, again, used to the deceit, both in politics, but that's also true in our personal lives. When you hear a person actually speaking the blunt truth, there's something which is shocking about it because no one does it. Because again, we also live in a society which is overly politically correct. Again, where people can't say what they feel, what can't express what they believe. And likewise, because we live in actually a chaining to the feelings of other people, feelings which are not based in goodness or truth, but are based upon their own objective or uh, subjective reality, their relativistic beliefs, and we have to, what, we can't say anything. But see, when you can say the truth, which is what's being said, which is also why people, the first people to say it, though, are not always, again, doesn't necessarily mean that they're people to be trusted. <laughs> Because oftentimes they will have their own agendas. But still, how can you tell if you're authentic and self-aware? Because to be self-aware just means to examine oneself, to know oneself. Again, which also means that you have to take time. Mm -hmm. Which is why, again, from this point, standpoint of Ignatian spirituality, that actually, for the most part, the entirety of the Jesuit spirituality is focused around self-awareness. That's what actually, when you really break down Ignatian spirituality, is that the most important thing that, that Ignatius will tell to his disciple, to his people who are following in his way of life is he's like, if you forget to pray, ask God for forgiveness, let it go, and make your firm intent to pray the following day. He said, but the one thing, if you're going to lose everything in the day, make sure you have your examine, your examination of conscience, where you process what happened throughout the day. Because what Ignatius recognizes very quickly is that without self-awareness, he will never grow. Or he's going to grow sideways. So he has to have constant, constant self-awareness. And he has to make a choice to be self-aware each and every day. To process what went on within his mind, within his affect, within his feelings, and what he did in his actions. Now again, this is again part of Ignatian spirituality. Not everyone is called Ignatian spirituality. But again, all of us are called as Catholics to self-awareness because all of us are called to the frequent use of the sacrament of confession. Because without self-awareness, you're not going to know what to confess. But again, sometimes our examination of conscience, or for some, I can say this because I hear confessions. <laughs> um, sometimes our examination of conscience, I'm hearing things from adults, people who are well-intentioned and good, but it sounds like the same exact thing that a second grader is saying, or a third grader, or a fourth grader. Because, but, also, but that doesn't coincide if you think about it. The sins of a second or a third grader, actually for the most part, most second and third graders don't really need to go to confession. We get them in the habit right now of going to confession, but for the most part, all they have is venial sin. Again, for the most part, most of the people who need confession frequently, much more frequently than a child, is adults. It's also what Jesus says, that's what I was thinking about with the readings today. He says, unless you accept a child into your midst, that's what my homily was on, which maybe you probably heard, Again, unless you accept a child in your midst, you must be like a child in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. Sometimes we, again, we think of children wanting to be like their parents. And again, sometimes we try to make our, parents, our children like ourselves. But what Jesus says, if you want to get into heaven, you must make yourself like your child. That's what you have to be like. You don't make your child like you. You become like your child because your child is innocent. Your child naturally loves the way that God intended you to love. It's only when a child gets broken or experiences, again, pain or suffering, or when they get older and they start becoming more aware, that again, that you start having sin enter into the picture. Because actually, confession, for the most part, is something which adults need desperately, which is why many of the saints, even John Paul II, Joan of Arc, all these different saints through history have went to confession frequently. Frequently. Some every single day. Because why? Because for them, again, before you have Ignatius and the examination of conscience, Although, with, obviously, with John Paul II, you had this. But, again, going to frequent conf was confession was a way in which people maintained and became constantly aware. Because it was a check and balance. Because without it, it's so easy to forget. There's actually a lot of philosophy which is being done right now, the philosophy of forgetfulness. And why human beings forget and what we do when we actually forget. It's very interesting. But, again... So, if you're deceiving yourself, it sometimes is difficult, which is why a check and balance to make sure that you are not deceiving yourself isn't the constant examination of conscience. You, can do it, you don't have to go to confession to do an examination of conscience either. You can do an examination of conscience each and every day. An examine should be more than just, again, counting out our sins. It should be processing the day and saying, what went on on a deeper level? What went on deeply in my life today? 
not just who won the football game. You know, well, that's fine. <laughs> but again, what went on in my relationships today? As opposed to pushing problems away or pushing conflicts away, what went on? How did I handle the day? How did I do it? Now, see, if you do an exam every day, you're constantly being self-aware. If, if you don't do an exam every day and you only go to confession once every six months, then how often are we actually being self-aware? Because self-awareness is not a feeling. It's actually not even a thought. Self-awareness is a choice. A choice that we make or a choice that we don't make. And it requires time. It requires time. So, again, <laughs> with self-deception, <laughs> we always have a tendency to see ourselves in the best light. This is what Carl uh, Jung the psychologist says, through pride we are ever deceiving ourselves. But deep down below the surface of the average conscience, a still small voice will tell us that something is out of whack. We always, again, and it's not a bad thing, we want to see ourselves and experience ourselves in the best light. But again, we also have to be aware even of that. We have to be aware of that we have a natural tendency to see ourselves as the best. We also have a natural tendency to see the worst in other people. Again, the beam and the splinter. And actually, the, you have to make a choice. And actually, what I tell all my couples who come through marriage prep is that you have to make a choice. He said, I want to, you to elevate your sin and what you assume your sin to be. I want you to elevate that. And I want you to, what you assume the sin of another person to be, I want you to decrease that. So, for instance, if you think you're dealing with, and again, if you were here last night, a disordered sin. Again, something which is small, something you can't really help. Why don't you elevate your own sin to the level of maybe this is getting to the point of malice? Because then you can become what? You want to work more quickly on it. And likewise, if you think you're dealing with a malicious sin in another person, why don't you de elevate that down to the level of disorder, which will cause you to become a lot more patient? Because with malice, malicious sin, we have to expect immediate results. But with disordered sin, we have to be very patient. Because disorders are acquired over time, and they're also broken over time. Malices are oftentimes gained in a moment and therefore can be gone in a moment. Which is also why the apostles come to Jesus at one point and they say, Lord, we could cast out certain demons, but there were other demons we couldn't cast out. And Jesus says, that's true. He said, because certain demons are only cast out through fasting and prayer. Which is another way of saying certain demons are only cast out through what? Fasting and prayer, which take place in an act of the will and a constant act over a period of time. So, for instance, a lot of the, uh, for instance, sexual sins are oftentimes disordered sins. They're not acquired in a moment, and they're oftentimes not lost in a moment, but a consistent pattern of behavior, a consistent new pattern of life can change it. Likewise, again, malice, if you encounter a malice abuse, you can expect immediate results, which is always why, again, when we look at ourselves, we sometimes, we don't, and we don't want to change, or we know how hard it is to change, we'll oftentimes take our more serious sin and we'll de-elevate them. Again, this is something that actually most of us intuitively know. I'm just putting words to what a lot of people already know. So I'm not, I'm not again, saying probably some of this is not necessarily new for some people. But again, we have to de-elevate the sins of others. Because as soon as I see my brother's sin, I automatically assume the worst. Which is that maybe no, maybe it's not. Maybe it's that they're just dealing with something which is disorder. Does this make sense? So again, even in dealing in our own sinfulness, it's always important that we do this because otherwise we will always see ourselves in the best possible light and we won't work. We won't work at our spiritual life. We won't work at examining ourselves. Again, but also there's another thing. In our lives, we wear masks. And see, this is not a bad thing. You have to wear masks. Different, or another way of saying it, different hats. You have your work hat. You have your house hat. You have your out in the car hat. You have all the different hats, all the different masks that we wear. But see, at the end of the day, a mask which we wear is oftentimes, again, a self-protective measure, which at times we need because we live in a world at war. To actually expose yourself completely all the time and take off your mask, all, all the masks that we wear, and to be completely honest and forthright with any person on the street is a very dangerous thing. And it's not very wise. <laughs> and if you read the book of Wisdom, you read the book of Sirach, it says, be friends with many people but trust few. <laughs> Again, actually having a, a slight suspicion and having a mask is not necessarily a bad thing because if you trust the wrong person, Again, a person who God does not necessarily place in your life. Some people will say, well, God places everyone in your life. No, sometimes we are put into situations where we are being called to grow and to have good boundaries and things like this. So just because a person comes into our life, sometimes, again, 
we have to keep masks on because, again, we've all probably experienced a person who comes to us and pours out their entire life story immediately. And this is not healthy. Because <laughs> one, but now they're oftentimes starving. They're starving on an emotional, relational level. And that's why they're doing it. But they, the more that they do that, the more that they will get pushed away further and further. And the only person who's going to want to be friends with them oftentimes is, one, a person who's going to take advantage of them. Or two, a person who's just doing it out of a sense of guilt. <laughs> and therefore, it's not authentic. Does that make sense? So that's why even wearing masks is not, and that's why I'm saying we have to wear masks in our lives. And this is also why God tells us, Jesus tells us, be as wise as serpents and as gentle as doves. Because at the end of the day, what these masks that we wear in all different lives, again, goes to the question of intimacy. And there's three fundamental key components to intimacy. The first one is vulnerability. The second one is honesty. And the third one is self-awareness. If you are missing one of these three components in any relationship you have, including your relationship with God, you won't have intimacy. Because what? You can have a relationship where you, a person is self-aware, they know who they are, they're honest, but they are completely invulnerable. They won't share. They won't communicate. That's why communication is so important. But what? You keep hitting a brick wall with the same person because they just won't communicate. They won't talk about the issues that even they themselves know. Therefore, intimacy is thwarted. You can also have a relationship which is the person is willing to be vulnerable. They're honest about it, but they are completely unaware. And therefore, these are people who are shallow. It's also why Jesus tells Peter, come out into deep waters with me. I want you to bring you into the deep waters. Because shallowness is, again, something. People who just spend the entirety of their life pursuing the things of the world, sports, football, things like this, again, or again, just parties and things like this, again, they never develop depth. And likewise, it's not that they're bad people, but they're shallow. And they also won't have intimacy because intimacy is all about depth. You can also obviously have a person who's self-aware. They're vulnerable, but they're dishonest. They lie. The person who's the manipulator, the liar. And all these things, again, because if we want to have intimacy, again, and that's why we actually have two vocations whose primary role is to provide us with intimacy. First is marriage, who you are called to take off all of your masks with who you can be completely vulnerable and intimate with. The other one is priesthood. Holy orders. So good. But we're not called necessarily to intimacy. We're called to varying levels of intimacy. And having varying levels of intimacy with various people is not inappropriate. But see, we also have to have intimacy with God. Intimacy with God is absolutely key and fundamental. Which is also why we have to have all three of these things. Which is why a person who won't communicate with God won't pray. It's not going to have intimacy. A person who's not self-aware and won't bring up and won't go to those areas of their life and they just stay in the shallows won't have intimacy. And therefore when problems happen, they dry up. Like the seed in the field which gets caught up in the field, the shallow soil burns up as soon as adversity comes. And the third one, again, a person who's not willing to bring, they only come to God and they think in some type of thwarted, twisted way that God only wants them to talk about the happy things. Or they only come to church to be happy. Again, is that they're not willing to be honest and bring out their crap. <laughs> yes, God does. Now, God doesn't want us to just bring all of our dirt to him. He also would like to know about the good things in life. That's why we need to always be in a constant conversation. The same thing is in a marriage, which is always why the relationship with God and mankind is always compared to a marriage. Because again, we're called to what? Share the things in our life with our spouse. And the more you share... The more you have intimacy, the more you will have a good relationship. And the same is true of our relationship with God. But again, all three of these things, these three things are not thoughts and they're not feelings. They're acts of the will. Because you choose to be honest, you choose to communicate, and you choose to be self-aware. Does this make sense? So, again, but the more that we wear masks the more that we can oftentimes start identifying ourselves with our masks, which is the danger of, again, always wearing the mask. Now, God, actually, I would say from the beginning, Adam and Eve didn't intend us to wear masks. We don't have to. And actually, heaven is a, complete, is a place of complete intimacy with all people. There's no longer a need to wear masks. It's a place of complete in of intimacy, of complete bliss. But the problem with wearing masks is that at a certain point, the more we wear masks, and especially that we're self unaware, the more that we will start believing the mass to be ourselves. Which is the more that we, again, especially avoid self-reflection, avoid those painful things that we oftentimes don't want to think about, the more that we will oftentimes start deceiving ourselves. 
So, the seven deadly sins are, again, things that we teach to little children. Again, the relationship with God, like a husband and wife, is meant to be the same thing, is that we're called to be in that relationship with God, God who wants to be intimate with us. And then likewise, the question is, though, are we? Because as we all know in every relationship, a relationship takes two. Now God, I can tell you right now, is doing his part. He already has done his part, and he's doing his part, and continues to do his part. But the real question is, is are we doing our part? Because again, just like every relationship, at times one person stops working, and the relationship starts having problems. So, but then again, practical question is, how do, we, how do we actually do this? How do we actually grow in intimacy? How do we grow in self-awareness? And that's again, the reality check is the examination of conscience. Because again, this is a choice that we make to become self-aware. But the examination of conscience is, again, where we look at ourselves, but it's meant to be more than just what we did when we were children. Children, again, just look at the Ten Commandments and say, okay, I didn't, I didn't worship Buddha. Okay, I do. I didn't say GD. Three, I went to church this week. Four, I obeyed my parents. Five, I didn't kill anyone. Thank God I didn't do that. <laughs> Six, I, did I commit adultery? Um, that's what I love when little like five-year-olds and six-year-olds come and say I committed adultery. I'm like, I don't think you know what that means. <laughs> and they're like, no, I committed adultery. What, I'm like, what'd you do? I hit my sister. That's not adultery. <laughs> okay. And then seven, what? That we're called not to steal. Again, people who think, well, okay, I haven't stolen anything. I didn't go into a, shop, a store and shoplift. Eight, not called to bear false witness. Okay, I didn't lie. Okay, maybe I did lie. Uh, I lied about that little thing to my wife. And then we go to what? Nine and ten. I haven't been jealous. Or maybe I have been jealous. Okay, that right there, that's Ten Commandments. Okay? That's a child's examination of ch conscience. That's not an adult's examination of conscience. That will get you into heaven. <laughs> but that's not going to bring you into deep intimacy. Because that's not going to bring you into deep self-awareness. Because again, you can also look at the seven deadly sins. Because this is also another way in which people do the examination of conscience. I usually try to go through both lists when I'm doing mine. The examination of conscience where we look at the seven deadly sins. Again, the person thinks, okay, well, I haven't been lustful. Okay, I overate. Again, greed, sloth. Okay, maybe I was a little bit lazy this week. Wrath. Okay, I got frustrated a couple of times. Envy, pride. Okay, I don't think I'm prideful. And no, I'm not envious. Again, that's good. That's what it usually a third or fourth grader does. And actually for the four, third or fourth grader, that's sufficient because for the most part, they haven't done any of these things. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you this because for the most part, most third or fourth graders most certainly don't usually have a lot of gluttony and don't have usually a lot of pride. But I can tell you this, most of the Ten Commandments, the more time, the more when we need to know them much more is not in our youth where we don't even really know how to break them. It's as adults. It's likewise the seven deadly sins. Most of the seven deadly sins, you tell them to a second or third grader, as many of us were told in second, third grade, and you're just confused. You're just like, well, I don't even understand what lust means. Although I have little kids coming and confessing lust, and they don't even know what it means. Because what? They haven't hit puberty yet. <laughs> so what? They don't really start to understand lust until they hit puberty. They don't start really understanding greed until they enter into the workforce. They don't really start entering into gluttony until life becomes unstable and they f want to what? To keep themselves afloat, which is oftentimes what we use gluttony for is to suppress things. We try to what? Comfort ourselves. Again, they might know sloth. I'll give you that. They might know sloth, like being lazy. Although I, most of the kids I know are over, overburdened with energy. But again, I can tell you this, all of the seven deadly sins, if you look at them in on a deeper adult way, you can see in a very real sense how all of these things affect adults especially. Which is why we do train, and we are called to train the young. And this is not a bad thing. I'm not saying that we're not called to train the young and tell them these things. But we prepare them for later on in life. Because we prepare them for when these things get real. Does this make sense? Because all of these things get very real later on in life. Especially in marriage. And also, again, especially in, as the older we get, these things become more and more real. Because these things become things which become constant things that we battle over and over again. Again, the child, again, when they approach this, don't really understand this. But again, if you think about this in the context of marriage, especially, you'll find a lot of these things. Because again, a lot of times why relationships break apart is specifically because one of those things is present. 
I can tell you actually every relationship which breaks apart, one of those things is present. Which at this point, again, 50% of marriages in the United States is ending in divorce. And a lot of it is due to lust. A lot of it is due to pride. Very often it's due to envy. One spouse envies the other. Again, a lot of times what one person is completely won't do, won't pick up and do their part. Sloth. Again, sometimes we just look at these things in the physical, in a very carnal, literal, physical way, and we can sometimes miss the nuances of how these things actually are not just meant to be understood literally, but they're also be understood figuratively. And likewise, for instance, because you can apply all these things not just to, again, physical life, for instance, lust, not just to adultery. This can also be what? Emotional. Emotional, again, when a person detaches and won't communicate anymore. There's a type of what? Abandonment, which happens within that. Because for the examine, being aware of my time, again, we are, again, this is all classic Thomistic, theolo- Thomistic philosophy and theology. Again, we're a combination of body, spirit, and soul. But what does that mean? That means we have, again, three different types of needs. Again, these things do have practical differences. Again, these are not just, again, although they are deeper philosophy, Again, these things have a practical application in our lives. Because if you understand body, spirit, and soul, you also, hopefully, it would come to mind that you have needs of your body, spirit, and soul. The needs of the body, again, are pretty apparent. That's what we oftentimes focus on. But again, what is even the soul? The soul, again, actually, even Thomas says that animals have souls. Trees have souls. The soul is that which makes something alive. It's what takes a body and animates it. And so likewise, you can say the things that we share in common with animals are, you can say, actually needs of the soul. Relationship, again, companionship, again, stability, things like this. All those fundamental things were oftentimes components of, again, pack behavior. <laughs> again, that actually, for the most part, the pack doesn't bite and kill each other. <laughs> so for actually the most part, you can say that. But there's something which distinguishes human beings from animals as well, because we're not just animals. Because if we were just animals, then you could be just like an animal. But as we see people who behave like animals, we recognize something is wrong. Because we also have the needs of spirit. And this is what we share in common with angels, which do exist. Angels, which are what? Beings of intellect and will. Because again, if you were to put that in three different terms, you have physical needs, emotional needs, and you have intellectual needs. You have all three of those types of needs. You can also, because you have all three types of those needs, you can also sin against all three of those things. You can sin in the body. You can sin within the heart, within the emotions. And you can sin within the mind. And actually, the sins of the mind are sometimes the most dangerous. Because the sins of the mind is rooted most closely to that which is eternal. Because again, it's our mind which distinguishes the the intellect and the will. When we sin on the level of intellect and will, it's very, very dangerous. But these are things which are oftentimes not things you can see. Because they're spiritual properties. Does this make sense? Again, sins of thought. And I'll give you a perfect example of a grave sin, which is a sin of thought. Hatred. Because you can smile nice at someone. (laughs) And you can hate them in your heart. And you can hate them in your mind. You can actually kill a person within your mind. And truly hate them with every fiber of your being. But you can smile. Again, we do it, we do it real good in the South. <laughs> you just, you smile at someone, give someone sweet tea. <laughs> again, but again, you can hate someone and smile at them. But what? This is a sin of the mind and of the heart. Which never manifests itself. Again, deep-seated hatred and resentment is something which, again, is antithetical to God. It will destroy a relationship and it will also destroy the human heart. But again, these are things which, again, if you just look at sin on the level of the body and the level of physical, well, you can say, well, I didn't kill them. <laughs> again, you actually, if you hate someone within your heart, the real question becomes, what commandment are you, are you breaking? Because you can lie to yourself and look at all the different commandments and say, okay, I didn't do this one, didn't do this one, didn't do this one. But hatred in the heart goes to what? It is a breaking of one of the commandments. The fifth commandment, which is thou shalt not kill, But it's not the fifth commandment in a physical way. It's the fifth commandment in an intellectual way. Does this make sense? Because you can take a look at actually all the different Ten Commandments and very simply say, how have I sinned against this commandment in the body? Which obviously if it's coming out in the bodily way, again, this is something which is dangerous. But again, these are oftentimes sins of the flesh. But you can also say, how have I sinned within my heart, within my feelings? How have I indulged and allowed those feelings to take over? 
and I haven't tried to control them, I haven't tried to suppress them, I've just let them give them over. Again, deep-seated hatred, resentment, again, where we allow those thoughts just to continue on, and we allow the feelings to go on and on and on. Which is why Ignatius, again, says that awareness is, again, awareness on an intellectual level, awareness of what goes on within one's mind, but it's also an awareness of where one, what goes on within one's feelings, because from behind the feelings is the affect. And the affect is, again, that heart that God has given to all of us from which joy, peace, serenity lies. But it also, again, can give rise to hatred, to violence. Long before hatred and violence and abuse is ever perpetrated on a physical level, it comes from within. That's what actually the gospel reading was today. It comes from within. And I'll tell you this, one of the things that oftentimes is one of the things that we don't really think about but again, long before f- hatred and violence comes out, evil comes into the world in a physical manner, it's almost always first expressed verbally, in a verbal way, because we can also send speech. Again, because breaking of the fifth commandment, again, obviously, hopefully, I don't think anyone in this room has killed anyone, but in speech, in speech, we can absolutely destroy another person's reputation because we hate them. And you know what? We can even feel justified because what we said was true. So therefore, we haven't actually, if you look at the Ten Commandments in just a, seri- in a simple sense, is that you we didn't break the Eighth Commandment because you said what was true. But you did with malice and with hatred in your heart. Therefore, no, you didn't break the Eighth Commandment, but you most certainly broke the Fifth Commandment. But not in a physical way. You did it in an affective way. So again, just take again, because within all of us, we have that darker self that darker self, which is oftentimes shrouded in ignorance. That's again, I will not say that this is, we oftentimes don't even really understand and realize what's going on. It's shrouded in the, dig, in the darkness. That's why we have to allow light to shine within. But again, and this is not just once in our life or once a year. This is something that we have to do constantly because the more that we allow things to sit in darkness, the more that we again will start to deceive ourselves. And now we've gotten to the point in our culture where people are deceiving themselves where they can't even recognize right from wrong, good from evil, that they're qualifying and saying the things which are always been understood in human history to be wrong, or now they're starting to say, no, no, this is just what this is good for this person over here. But what does that come about? That comes about from a complete lack of awareness. A complete lack of awareness. It also comes from, again, a spiritual death, which has happened, again, for many people in our country. Because anyone who says that some of these things which are going on in our culture, which is right, so anyone who says that abortion is right, Again, I'm not saying that abortion is a mortal sin. Because in many cases it's not. But anyone who says that abortion is a good thing or is not a grave sin, there is something spiritually wrong with them. I'm not judging them. I'm just saying that this is an indication. It's just like a doctor. You see cancer cells within someone and then you tell the person they don't have cancer and that they have cancer and they get upset. No, this is something spiritually wrong. So that's where self-awareness, but again, this is not just true. We're not just called to go out and point. This is what we look first within ourselves because if we can't look like within ourselves and be like St. Paul and say, I understand what you're going through because I myself have gone through similar things, but there is healing. So just being able to do that, you can look at that. Just take the first commandment, for instance. First commandment, which is thou shall not have any other gods before me. Again, a perfect way of doing this in an examination, how you can do this on all three levels. Again, on the mind, of the spirit, and or the uh, physical body of the emotions, and likewise the intellect. Again, obviously if you're worshiping Buddha statues, <laughs> or false gods, or things like this, the Baals of the ancient old times. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but the uh, first time I heard a person who actually confessed this in a literal way, I was like, really? <laughs> so it's actually the only time I think I've ever lost my poker face in confession. <laughs> And when a person confessed to Odinism, Odin, Odinism, the old Norse gods, and I just, really? The person was like, it was a strange time. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I was like, you're forgiven. <laughs> I was like, but what? But the first commandment is not just about that. Again, addictions, drugs, things like this. Alcohol, which becomes any type of addictive behavior, which we see all throughout our culture. Addictions to sex, addictions to uh, prescription pills, all the things that you cannot live without. The thing that at the end of the day you're looking forward to. Now if you're looking forward to your family, that's a good thing. But if you're looking forward to that drink, that's a problem. And that what? That's the sign of addictive behavior. That's a sign of something which is seriously wrong. That's a sign of a false god. Because what you live for is what is your god. So at the end of the day, again, drugs, alcohol, but again, these are still all things which are very easily seen. These are all levels on the first commandment, how they're broken in terms of physical. 
because there's physical addictions. Again, but people who overwork, again, obviously, again, people can say, that, well, I'm, I made it to my hour of church on Sunday, and therefore I obeyed the third commandment. I haven't broken any commandment. People who overwork, again, they live for their job. They can't do anything other than their job. They have a false god. But again, this still is on the level of physical. Again, students who again, study to the point of exhaustion, to the point where they can't do anything else, they become study, good grades become a false god. Still physical, though. Again, TV, <laughs> which is a huge addiction in the United States. Again, so actually the interesting thing about, I don't know if you, this is just kind of a side note of TV. There's been a lot of studies done on TV that a lot of people don't realize what happens with TV. TV shuts down the left side of your brain. It actually shuts down the left side of your brain, I believe, to between 7 and 3% of its normal functioning capacity. Although the right side of the brain stays almost at 100%. With the right side, which is the creative part, which is also not the analytic part, yeah, it will shut it down almost entirely. So that it's also why the TV is such an effective medium for indoctrination. Because you don't think, it's mindless. It's also one of the reasons why we like it. Because you can turn your mind off. You can just watch the TV and be entertained. But it's also why it's extremely subversive but again, people who become addicted to media or addicted to their phones, and that they can't ever put their phone down, which is again a lot of our youth today, are addicted to the internet, addicted to pornography, addicted to all these different things, which again, that they live for, that they again, they get anxiety if they think about not having it. These are all what? Indications of a false god. Actually, anything that we get anxiety over for the most part is always something we should be worried about because the only thing we should have anxiety about is, did I send today? <laughs> Did, is some, did something go wrong with my relationship with God or with my relationship with who God has given to me? That's the only thing we should have anxiety about. That's a healthy type of anxiety. But if we're anxious about anything else, the question is why? A lot of people get anxious about mammon, money, again, things like this. Again, God wants us to have prosperity and to have money to take care of things, but when we start living from them, where it causes us a tr tremendous amount of anxiety, which manifests itself in a bodily way oftentimes, and the number one killer of Americans is stress-related disease. Again, we know that we have a problem with false gods. But again, on the level of the heart, you can obviously sin against the first commandment. Because on the level of what? Relationships, again, if you've ever seen this, or you're aware, I'm sure all of us are aware of, again, clingy, people who are clingy, people who are manipulative, people who try to make people do what they want, people who are not necessarily lying, they just deceive to manipulate, to try to control people. But ultimately, it's all, at the end of the day, this type of behavior is indication of what? That people are making people gods. But it's also, again, another way in which we do it is that people who like to ignore, again, what we also call people who like to ignore the devil in their midst because they don't want to have conflict. They ignore, again, the people who are abusive because they don't want it to have problems in their marriage. And so they will enable people who enable and things like this. Again, it's not, you don't see the how you're breaking the first commandment at first if you look at it on the physical level because it looks like you're just being faithful in marriage. But people who enable bad behaviors or enable abusive behavior, oftentimes they have made the person who they're not willing to confront their God. And that's where a person becomes a God. But what? This is something that happens on the level of the heart. <laughs> it's when the level of the heart, an indulgence within the heart, where we want to overindulge the feelings and this is why I always again make the distinction between being nice and being kind. I'm not really a nice. I'm not really a kind per. I'm not really a nice person. I'll admit it. I try to be a kind person. <laughs> but what? That's why. Why feelings within our spiritual life are oftentimes people who live their lives according to feelings. Oftentimes get themselves into a lot of trouble. Because not wanting to hurt the feelings of another person, you oftentimes will not tell them the truth. And you'll tell a lie to their face. That's what a nice person does. A kind person, again, doesn't always beat people with the truth, but a kind person will tell the truth, even if it hurts. Because God does the same thing to us. <laughs> God will tell us the truth, even when it hurts. That's why God is kind. God is not nice. <laughs> and likewise, if you want, again, I'll tell you that. Look through the Old Testament. God is not nice. But God is very kind. And that's why, if you look at even Paul's writings, it says that if we, God did not discipline us, then he would not love us. We would be his illegitimate children. But because he disciplines us, it shows us that we are his children because only a real father loves his child enough to have the conflict with them to discipline them to try to make them better. So actually when we experience the kindness of God, it's actually 
proof of his love, proof that he's taking an interest. Because actually one of the greatest ways of we hate a person is by apathy. And God is not apathetic. God is always active. But people who become apathetic in relationships or try to become manipulative, controlling, again, try to control people through their emotions, again, which it doesn't always look like on the surface level what this actually is. What it is is the violation of the first commandment where they're making themselves, they're making their feelings, or they're making the other person a god. Does this make sense? Again, then you can look on the level of the intellect, the level of the mind. This is where, again, especially this is something which is actually a little bit easier to see because we, this is usually what people think about when they try to flip the first commandment around and looking at it, arrogance, pride. Obviously, a person who makes themselves God. Again, which is what Adam and Eve do in the Garden of Eden, the first commandment. Again, put God first in your life. But again, a serious way in which this is actually happens on the level of mind, think about it. When you say, I know more than the church. The church who is not just a bunch of old men, but it's the Holy Spirit who is speaking to us, telling us that God still has opinions about how we live today. Again, when people say, I know more than the church, this is spiritual pride. It's a violation of the first commandment. Again, but what is this? This is not something that we necessarily are going to tell to children because they, they don't, children don't do this. But adults do. We do it all the time. Again, or people who say, I know more than other people. I know this is, or people who buy into the doctrine of relativism, which is why John Paul II went so adamantly against relativism. Why Benedict, if you read any of Benedict's writings, he was going so much against relativism because relativism, which says that there is no absolute truth, is a false God because it makes the individual person the source of all truth, that you define truth for yourself, that my truth is my truth, my goodness is my goodness, I am God, I determine what is true, beautiful, and good. And you turn yourself on a spiritual level, which is also why talking with a relativist is the hardest person to talk with because there's n almost no balance, there's no common denominator that you can come in f into contact with because they will not accept truth. Which is why it's the most dangerous, I could say it's probably the most dangerous spiritual sin that we have because it's a direct violation of the first commandment. But it's not on a physical way, it's hard to see because it's, what, it's entirely spiritual. It's entirely, what, intellectual. And a person makes a firm amendment of their will, I will not change my mind. And see, when people do that, there's not much you can do with them. That's why even St. Paul says, there's certain people, even in the community, when people do certain things, you have to sometimes love them at a distance. You can try to talk and communicate, but if they're not willing to, you, can, you can't drag a horse to water to make a drink. But again, all of these ways, you can take each and every one of the commandments and what? Just ask yourself on a practical level, if you want to grow in self-awareness, know what an authentic examination is. Again, how have I sinned against this particular qu this commandment on the level of body, level of heart, and on the level of our intellect. Because mm -hmm. I can tell you, children don't need this, but adults do. And this is where you start seeing, okay, maybe there's a lot more darkness in my heart than I thought. But the beautiful thing again about our faith is that God just doesn't leave us in darkness. He brings light. And that's the importance of, again, going back to the first class, why we don't identify a person and their sins, because we can also not identify ourselves with our sin. We don't say that we are equal to our sins. We look for truth, we allow goodness to purify us so we can experience the beauty of what God wants to give to us. Because we never identify both ourselves and the person with these errors. But if we don't become aware, then as we know, it never changes. And God wants us to grow. So again, these are just a couple practical ap uh, applications of how you can take a deeper look at the examination of conscience to say, am I being self-aware? Because when you do this, this obviously takes a little bit of time. And this takes more than two, three minutes to really do this, to process this and look through. But if you want to grow in self-awareness, if you want to know, if, am I self-deceiving myself? Are there really things in my life? Then you can just take this very simple thing, body, spirit, and soul. Which again, most of us know that. Body, spirit, soul. Human beings are those three things. That means I can sin against all three. And just taking that step by step through each of the commandments. Have I sinned again? Or using the seven deadly sins. Have I, again been unchaste? Have I been lustful on the level of my mind? Have I been lustful on the level of my actions, my body? Have I been lustful within my heart, within my feelings, that I've allowed that feeling, that lustful feeling to just reside there and stay there? 
The same thing can be true with greed, of anger, of pride, of envy. All of these different things. And when you start looking at it on a deeper level, then you start becoming free of it because you can change and allow Christ to change your behavior. So next week, what our class will be on, <coughs> what we'll be talking about, is again, that's what we do on the level of, again, the true examination, which starts with sin, but it doesn't end with sin because we can't just end with sin and darkness and what we're called to do. It's also about what we're being called out into the world to do. Because it's not, again, the examination of conscience, and even according to Ignatius, the first part of the examine is, again, growing in an awareness of our sin, but then we use virtue to replace it. And Jesus also says this, if you clean out your house, the house of your soul, if you clean your house out and you don't replace it with something else, that demon's going to come back with seven friends. And you're going to be in a worse position than you were before. So you have to replace it with something else, which means you need to know what to replace it with. And specifically what you replace it with, what you replace every sin with, is always a virtue. But again, the virtues are something which, again, are very precise and understood correctly. They provide all the answers to the sins because a virtue cannot live at the same time in the heart of a person who has vice. But if you understand the virtues correctly, next week we'll be talking about justice and how justice is actually, when you live your entire life in virtuous behavior and you embrace the four cardinal virtues, because this is a kind of a teaser for next week, you have no control over your three theological virtues. Which again, in baptism you are given faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love, as St. Paul and Jesus says. Again, faith, hope, and love. Those are given to you in baptism. You have no control over them. Again, but that doesn't mean that just because now you, the way you pray and increase in faith, hope, and love is you beg God for more. And he will always give you more. But you're not in control of your faith, hope, and love. The human response, so that's the God response. That's the God gift is faith, hope, and love. His part that he gives to us is faith, hope, and love. That doesn't mean that we do nothing. Because again, just like relationship is always reciprocal. Again, our human response, the way in which we respond to God's gifts of faith, hope, and love is through the four cardinal virtues. Because you can, again, choose to be all four of those virtues. Again, the way in which we prepare our hearts is that we are just. We strive for prudence. Again, that we are temperate in our behaviors. And that we are always fortuitous, which brings fortune. Again, but to open pack and open those, that's what for the next four weeks we're going to be looking at is one virtue each week to say, okay, what is justice and how do I become just? Because once you understand what justice is, it's wonderful. Because there's, justice is one of those words which is thrown around a lot in the world today. And it's oftentimes abused. So to actually understand what justice is concretely, simply, and how does it apply in a practical level in my life actually brings a lot of stability and peace. Which will be next week. So let's just go ahead and close in a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to come together tonight. Just ask you, Lord, to keep us safe as we go our separate ways. Open up our hearts for those of us who are going to the Eucharist to receive your Son more fully. We just ask you, Lord, to light upon our minds, give us the understanding, the knowledge to see where you're calling us to act, to bring your love into this world and transform the world into the kingdom of God in the here and now. We ask all this through the intercession and in the words which Christ gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.